Amen, amen. Good morning, guys. Good to see your beautiful faces. We've had a great weekend of celebration, amen. Uh, what we, uh, we also want to celebrate one, uh, uh, congrats Mitchell and Willow and their new baby. That's adorable. Absolutely precious. Congrats, guys. You guys look great. Glowing and full of energy, I'm sure. So that, that laugh tells me so, amen. Uh, amen. Congrats, guys. Very, very cool. Just uh, be, uh, be parents in it together and, and, you know, try and do things the right way, amen. Uh, so, uh, you know, also, guys, want to lift up uh, Nate. Great communion, bro. Nate's going to be preaching next Sunday with uh, college, the college semester starting up. So I figured we get our uh, campus minister up here to preach. So be good. And, um, yeah, you know, obviously we are celebrating uh, a wedding weekend, another wedding weekend. <laughs> Uh, Rissman Sneller wedding, nuptial, whatever you want to call it. It was awesome. Uh, it was it was hot. You know what I mean. It was a great time, uh, but it was it was awesome. I thank you guys so much for serving. Uh, the church always comes together for these things. It just does great, and people sacrifice and make things work. And uh, they looked encouraged. They looked like they saw God in that moment. And that's that's what matters. So uh, God used you guys to do that to help them see. Uh, him and his and their special day. So thank you guys for serving always with all your hearts. Um, very cool as well. You can see uh, a lot of old friends. Good to see Anna Freeman back in town. Good to see, uh, good to see, uh, good to see a sister Anna. Anna's Anna's a comedian, man. I, whenever you're around, Anna, even when you don't know, Anna's probably plotting some kind of joke on you. So just be careful. You're probably lucky you don't have social media if you. Uh, don't know Anna, amen. So, but um, man, at the wedding though yesterday, it was it had a kind of an epiphany. Uh, you know, the, the customary uh, daughter father dance, and, and Jim and, and Sammy were dancing, and KP was actually walking up to me in that moment, and you know, we're like, wow, that's special. It's always special to watch that dance, right? And and he's like, you know, just, so me and KP just ex- exchanging small talk, and uh, behind him, oh, he's like, man, what are you doing? Are you just out here just getting cool or something like that? And I'm like, I'm watching Adeline and, and Ruth. Because Adeline, uh, Brittany had to go take Archer to a swim party. So I'm trying to keep an eye on the kids while you know, I'm trying to keep an eye on, on the dance and just trying to take it in. And, and I'm like, yeah, I'm out here trying to babysit. And I remember thinking, I, I, just, I don't know why it came out of my mouth, but I remember thinking, man, bro, like, this is going to be us like, in the blink of an eye. And uh, <laughs> we're just like, yeah, I guess that's true. And uh, so it just it kind of made me emotional. I was like, wow. Like, and he's like, man, is, he, is she three now? I was like, she is three. Uh, so it's very scary. Uh, <laughs> Very scary uh, to think about that. So it was it was slightly convicting, um, just to think about how fast time flies, and, and it made me want to you know just hug my daughter a little closer, all three years old of her. Uh, think you know think of see how you know Jim was was hugging his his daughter, and I'm sure blinked and you know Sammy's you know a lot of us saw Sammy grow up right. Um, and so later that night. Ruth has her first sleepover with Adeline. We're like, well, you're already with us. You might as well stay the night, right? And, and so, um, you know, they, we, 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 uh, we have this little tent in her room to make her bedroom special, to keep her in the bedroom as much as she can. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, for me, it's that. I don't know for Melissa. For me, it's that. Uh, so Melissa's in there, hey, guys, let's read a story time, you know? And the girls are in there. I'm like, oh, let me, let me, yeah, let me get some of this story time, right? And, Destiny was staying the night as well. Welcome, Des- Des- it's always great to have Destiny back. And so I'm like hanging out with Destiny. I'm like, Destiny, I got to go up there. I'm going to say, say goodnight to my kid, right? And um, So I go up there. I'm like, so I'm trying to sneak my way in. And Ruth's like, get out of here. Oh. And it just felt like no boys allowed, you know? I'm like, what are you, t-? like, so I try to sneak it again. She's like, get out of here. I'm like, what? What are you doing, girl? Like, I'm, I'm trying to be an engaged dad right now, right? And, Everything that I've been told I need to be. And I'm trying to fight through this rejection. <laughs> She's like, and I'm like, oh, I think there she was saying, like, hey, we're, we're different animals. I'm like, Ruth, I can, be, I can be a fly. She's like, no, get out of here. I'm like, can I just be a fly in your world, you know? And so I'm like, I'm just going to sit outside. And I'm going to sit outside the tent. And she looks outside. She gives me this little smile, like, you stay out there, you know? <laughs> but uh, it felt like. You know, I just thought about God's heart. You know, God just wants to draw near. We may push him away. We may feel like there's times where it's like, you know, we're just, you don't have the, it's not the dad phase. I hear that a lot. Like, hey, it's just, you'll have your time, bro. And I'm like, when's my time? It's, it's always Melissa's phase, it seems like. 
Uh, you know, but it, sometimes we have our phases with God. We have our seasons where we struggle, and we just don't even know why we struggle sometimes. Maybe there's some deep buried trauma that's unearthing, and we're not aware of what it is and what it's trying to reveal, and we're just like, I don't feel like reading my Bible. I don't feel like going to church. I don't feel like sharing my faith. I don't want to be generous with my time or my money, and, and, and we just, sometimes we just go through those things, and God's like, hey, I'm here. I'm here. And I will stick around. I'll stick it out. I want to be near, and I want you to draw near to me. I want to, I want to be in that tent party. I want to hang out. I want to understand why you think the way you think. And, and I want to be engaged. I want to be involved. And that's very much, I believe, God's heart. So we're going to turn back to Hebrews today. You know, we're studying that out. And Hebrews chapter 10, the title of our sermon this morning is Draw Near. God draws near to us. So how, what does it mean for us to draw near to him? Let's pray. Father, good morning. Uh, it's good to, uh, good to be together, good to think about you, good to focus on you and, and, and your character and your goodness and how you fight to draw near. And I pray that the scriptures make that very clear this morning, how, how you fight to draw near to us. And I pray that you also allow the scriptures to make it very clear how we, we can draw near to you and, and respond and reciprocate that, that kind of love so that those that are not familiar with that love can see it in us, Father. It's, it's very challenging to think about, you know, 1 John 4, verse 12, that you know, there's, no one's ever, uh, that verse says, no one has ever seen God, but if you love one another, he's seen in you. And uh, it's, it's, it's very convicting to think about God. You would put that on us, but uh, it's also inspiring to know that we can live up to that through your Holy Spirit. So we pray, Father, your scriptures help us to live up to that as we are inspired by your love for us this morning. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. You guys there? All right, here we go. Verse 19 is a little bit of background, right? These are um, ostracized former Jews who have chosen to follow Jesus about 60 A.D. Uh, most, most folks say they're uh, uh, in, in the Greek region, right, Macedonia, and uh, they're trying to figure out how to stay faithful. It's predominantly a, a Jewish region, but it's Greek-speaking, okay? So you got all these cultural forces coming at this church. They're formerly Greek, but they're, they're in a Greek place, but they're formerly Jewish. So you got two worlds pulling at them, and both of those worlds are saying Jesus should not be Lord, and they're trying to stick with Jesus as Lord in this passage, all right? So chapter 10, verse 19, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. And with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. We'll continue to read the rest here. But the first point this morning is to draw near to God. If we're going to draw near to all the other aspects that we're going to be called to draw near to here, we must draw near to God. The Hebrew writer starts by reminding us of all the ways that God has already drawn near to us. It always starts with God, right? And we have covered these concepts in previous lessons this year as we've gone through Hebrews, but the writer takes time to review some of them for our convenience, it seems, right? So, and the first being that God has drawn, because he's drawn near to us, the Bible says, that, and it uses this word, confidence. We now have confidence. That word is used previously in Hebrews chapter 4, and the confidence that that invokes is the same idea as this boldness of freedom of speech. You think of the boldest people you see today on social media like, I have my rights, I should say what I want. That's the same kind of confidence that God is saying we should have in, in terms of boldness and zeal and enthusiasm when we get in the presence of God, especially in terms of even entering, of all things, the most holy place. Let's remind ourselves here, right? What is the most holy place? The most holy place during the Old Covenant, which is what these folks were familiar with, it was only accessible once a year. And not only that, only once a year by only one person. Yeah. By not just any priest. You had to be a priest, first of all, but then you had to be the high priest. Yeah, right. And even then, when the high priest entered the most holy place, a tradition amongst the Jews developed, some of you guys may be aware of this, where they would tie a rope around one of the high priest's ankles when he went into that tent in case that priest died being in the presence of God. They were like, man, you, if you're in the presence of God, we got to tie this in case you die in there so we can pull you out. That 
was the kind of fear that revolved around ever just drawing near to God. To say draw near to God back then, it, wouldn't, it didn't give you all the fuzzies and, and warm feelings of, oh, God, yes. You know, it's, it was like, oh, man, whoa, 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 whoa. You're going to draw near to God? You, 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 have your, you, you talk to your family about this? Did you talk to your employer? Because they might be down an employer when this is all said and done. Did you put in your two weeks just in case? Because presence of God, Moses was the, cho- Moses was the old school like, chosen one, right? You saw his face after he saw God. And that was the back of God. (laughs) To be near God in the old covenant meant you were flirting with death. Because God's presence was and is still just too powerful. For he's too holy for any man, for even a high priest to be around. That's why you see Isaiah, right? Isaiah chapter 6, he sees God in a vision. He's like, oh, my gosh, get away from me. I'm a man of unclean lips. Away from me, God. That's why Peter, right, in Luke 5, when he realizes who he's talking to, he's like, Jesus, get away from me. I'm a sinful man. You can't, you can't be around me. I know, I think I know who you are. Get away from this boat, dude. You're going to kill me. But the Hebrew writer reminds us that Jesus died on the cross so that we would no longer have to have ropes tied around our ankles in case we die when we're in the presence of God. We don't have to wait once a year for the Day of Atonement to be in the presence of God, and we don't even have to be a high priest to be in the presence of God because we're all priests if we are disciples of Jesus, according to 1 Peter chapter 2. What's even more special is if you are a disciple of Jesus, God literally puts not just his presence around you, right? He puts his presence to, he puts it inside of you. He lets it live within you to reside in you as the Holy Spirit. Therefore, because of how much God wants to draw near to us, the writer says we should draw near to God. In this section, we see God removing every possible barrier so that he can be close. He's like, man, I'm going to take away the day of atonement. I'm going to take away this, this restrictive priesthood. I'm going to take away the fact that you got to be, you know, this, this, that. I'm taking it all away. And that I'm, I'm going to up the ante, and I'm going to make myself into a form of a spirit, and I'm going to reside in you. Do you believe that there is a God that does whatever it takes to be close to you? He sees all your issues. He sees all your quirks. He sees all the ways. You, you may be like, I'm so, I'm so goofy in this way. He's like, I, I, I see that, and I want to still be close. Sometimes we may look at our own sin, at our character flaws, and we may think, man, there's no way God would want to be that close to me. I'm messed up. I'm too messed up. I've messed up too many times. I'm too far gone. There's no way God would ever want to work through me, or how could he work through me? I'm too selfish, I'm too shy, I'm too, I'm too this, I'm too that, I'm not funny, I'm too funny, whatever the case may be. And so Satan will use our weaknesses and our sins to make us believe God does not want to be near. If it's not our sin or our character that Satan will use, Satan will then use our circumstances to make us doubt if God really wants to be near. If God really wanted to be close to me, my life would not have turned out this way. If God really cared about me, he would have answered this prayer. He would have bailed me out of the situation. Lord, you know how much I talked to you. Where were you? If you really cared, if you really wanted to be near, things would be different right now. I felt that before. If God really wanted to be near me, I would feel his presence. But instead, with all this drama in my life, I'm feeling a lot of things, like he's leaving me hanging. Satan will use our circumstances or our sin to make us forget that God's already removed every barrier to be close to us. 
What I love about this passage especially is he kind of reassures us in verse 22. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. What I love about this is God values sincerity. God says, hey, man, if you're coming, you don't got to be perfect, but, man, if you really want this, I can tell, and I, that's good enough for me. I can, tell, I can tell you want this. I can tell you're sincere about this. I can tell you, I appreciate what Dave and I said for communion. I can tell this ain't about what I can give you. I can tell that this is about me. This idea as well of full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. There's some Bible commentators that believe this is a, an allusion to Christian baptism. That when we repent, when we decide to say, hey, man, I'm changing my life. I'm dying to myself. I'm over my old life. I'm turning myself in. I'm going to get in that water. I'm going to die. I'm going to come back a new person. You got no reason to, to ever feel like you have no assurance that God loves you. Because at that point, he is literally inside of you. I've died. I've, you've resurrected. And now I'm in you. I live through you. Of course I want to use you. I mean, I've counted. It's like, wait, have you, sometimes we ask each other, have you counted the cost, right, to follow Jesus? Well, I, I think God's counted the cost to love us. God knows. God knows what he got into. He didn't get into his mouth. Oh, shoot, these people are crazy. <laughs> oh, my gosh. What did I get myself into? I think the spoiler alert was Genesis 2 or 3. So I think if God was any, was, we know he ain't surprised, but if he was surprised, the, the, bag was, the cat was out of the bag 4,000, 5,000 years ago. And he still sticks around. And Jesus came long after that. Yeah, right. We should have full assurance in Jesus that he always wants to be near. So how does the Hebrew writer want us to follow through on all this practically? Let's keep reading in verse 23. You guys with me? It says, verse 23, it says, let us hold unswervingly to the faith, uh, to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So if we draw near to God, the next step is to draw near to God's people. You know, guys, once again, this was a, a church that was heavily uh, uh, maligned and hated on. Talk about having haters. These guys had lots of haters. If they had a, if they had a Twitter account or an Instagram account, there would be all kinds of on their feet. Ah, these people are crazy. We can't stand them. Don't hire them. Don't, definitely don't hire them, right? Don't, don't join them. If they ask you for anything, don't get around them because they're going to love the hell out of you. And you can't even want that. That's, that's what they were known for was loving people to the point where people thought they were crazy. And so here they are, all these forces around them. And the writer knows this. And he's like, hey, if you guys are going to stay tight, you guys got to be intentional about doing so. Because there's going to be constant pressure to pull you away from each other and therefore from God. So how do we do this, right? First part, hold unswervingly to this hope that we profess. This idea of hope is so important because we need to have hope that, man, no matter what happens to us in this life, like it did for them, even if they lost everything, there was still hope. Why? Because he who promised was faithful. Jesus is faithful. No matter what, you're going to land on your feet, whether it's in heaven or in this life. Because if you lose your soul in this life, it doesn't matter what you got anyway. So he focuses them back on Jesus, who's the faithful one. And then he brings us up, this verse 24, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. This idea, right, we know what a spur is. You use that for a horse, you kick him, you get him in gear, right? Get, get what the horse is meant to do. Yeah. But if you're a horse, you don't necessarily want that per se. If, if I was a horse, that's, that's, that's sharp. Please, that, stop doing that. Let me just run. Can you find a different way to get me to do what I'm supposed to do? <laughs> but that's the point of a spur. The, the, the Greek word for this is parox, uh, paroxysmos. You know me, I learned that from BibleHub.com, right? <laughs> Which you can too, by the way. Anybody can go to BibleHub.com and look up the Greek. It's not, you know, you don't have to be a Bible scholar, right? 
paroxysmos literally means a provocation. You ever been provoked before? Someone egging you on, just, hey, hey, what you going to do about it? Remember one time we were playing kickball, a, a, a dodgeball, all the campus ministry guys, and somebody, somebody, somebody got fired up, and he started poking my campus ministry in the chest. Like, I'm my own man. I'm my own general. I'm like, oh, those are fighting words. What are we going to do right now? That's provocation, okay? And you're just like, oh, what's going to happen? These, these guys are about to fight. But not just that, it's a provocation which literally jabs or cuts someone, so they must respond. Look it up. That's literally what it says. That's what we're called to do for one another. God says, I'm going to put my spirit in you so you can, I, you, I can speak through you to challenge each other. Because I've done plenty of miracles by myself, and y'all ain't believing it. But maybe if I work through some of y'all sinful people, people would be like, well, maybe there's a God. The Bible says to do this thoughtfully, right? Because we see this idea that we must consider one another. We must consider Someone's texting me, so it's distracting. I'm sorry. I'm turning that off. Rookie move. So always turn your phone off, right? You know. At least I didn't forget my Bible on my way up here. I've seen that happen before. Uh, I ain't gonna say no names. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know if it, ain't nobody here. I'll say that. Uh, yeah, that probably him. Uh, the Bible says, right? Let us consider. That's an, that's, that, that means it takes some thought. You can't just be out here just jabbing people willy nilly like Mike Tyson. You know what I mean? Like, that's not how this works. The Bible says full of grace and truth. So we should be considerate. Of how, now, the jabbing must happen. It is inevitable if we're Christians. We need to intentionally provoke each other sometimes. Okay, Not like in a mean way, but just say what needs to be said. But we should be considerate about that. And in order to do this, this is, ties into the next point. We must be around each other. Okay, it's hard to know to consider someone if you're not around that person. If you don't get their aura, right? If you don't just feel whatever they are giving off in person, it's a little hard, right? I've heard it said by people much smarter than me, like my wife, that over half of all communication is nonverbal. Which means if I can't see you, even if I can hear the words that are coming out of your mouth, but I can't feel your presence and see your body language. See how you react to it, especially if I say something somewhat challenging. And I can't see that. I am not understanding over half of what you're actually communicating. Like, how am I supposed to actually help you at that point? How are we supposed to help each other if we're not around each other? That's why for those first Christians, they had to be together physically. Remember, these were ostracized former Jews. The Gentiles looked down on them. Their own people looked down on them, like really looked down on them. Their whole culture was pressuring them to walk away. The early church had to be close to help each other not quit on the Lord. You know, guys, I, I want to address this. I, I, I've been praying a lot about this, okay? Because I love this church. You guys, you, Jesus used this, Columbia, this church in Columbia to save my soul yeah. over and over. I have a life, I have a wife, and everything in between because of what, how God has worked through you guys. So in that, because of that, I will fight for this church. Amen. I will go down with the ship. I will do everything in my power to help us stay close to Jesus. Okay, so I say that with, with all love here, and I'm, you know, I, and I want to be very careful about this because we have our, some dear friends who are, have COVID right now, okay? That's why we have Zoom. That's why we have YouTube, because we have family right now that need it. There are exceptions, exemptions, and concessions we can always make. That's why the Bible says it's wise to have advisors in your life to talk through, wait, what is a need 
and what's a want. And I'm not, look, guys, we've been, we've been taking precautions with this, okay? We got a Zoom room downstairs. If people are careful about that. But I will say this, guys. It's, it's time. Guys, I, I don't know what to tell y'all, okay? I, I, I've, I was in Vision. I was in Orlando. And I'm hanging out with disciples from India. And I'm just like, just being around them, I'm convicted. I just, I talk to them, they're, they're, they're just like us, but they don't have, we think our life is hard. Their life is hard. They look at our life and they're like, what are you talking about? You live in America, bro. There's nothing wrong with your life. And they, they, don't, they don't lord it over me. They don't lord, they're so humble. They don't lord over anybody. But I, had, I was like, man, I'm convicted. I'm convicted about this. Guys, I, I, when it comes to this stuff, guys, whether if you're not here physically, you got to ask yourself why. Okay? And you got to ask yourself why. Whether it's midweek or church or Bible talk, and you, we set up Zoom, why are you not there? The Bible says don't make it a habit. Okay, it happens. Some things happen. Life happens. It's cool. Talk about it. But don't make it a habit. And it's, this is, guys, I say this because I love this church. I love our fellowship. And this is something we're struggling with right now. What is a need and what's a want? And sometimes with all things in our life, whether it's materially, health, sometimes we get those things confused. I get those things confused materially about what I need and what I want. And you know what I need? I need people in my life to tell me, bro, you don't need that. I've had that happen many times in my life. Guys, I just remember, I'll say this and I'll move on, okay? When I became a Christian, when I first entered this church, we used to meet in Jesse Ranch Auditorium. Yeah, we did. It was a party. And it wasn't because of the people, definitely not because of the people. You know what I mean? Like, we love each other. But I was like, I'm worldly, right? And I'm like, this group's interesting. <laughs> Why do I want to be part of this, you know? But I'm like, I couldn't fight it. I couldn't fight the, the, the realness. You can tell real from the fake most times. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm fake, but I, do I, I think I want to stay fake. I think I want to stay in my fake life. But, you know, I saw the reality in the lives of Christians. I couldn't fight it. I saw they were committed to something outside of themselves. And I said, I want to be like that. And so I went to church. I went to Friday night devotional with the campus ministry. I was like, why am I here on a Friday night? I should be out partying right now. And here I am. It's kind of goofy. But I couldn't fight it again. Like, this is real. There's nothing fake about this. No one's, there's no pretensions. Like, oh, this is who I'm supposed to be. And, you know, this is way before Instagram, so you really couldn't, you know, fake yourself out then, right? And then I went to midweek. I remember, guys, we used to jam into Rock Quarry House. Yeah. We all used to be, and we had to fight, figure out a way. I don't know how we did it. We would all just find a way to be in that house. Like, what do, like how do we do that? I'm sure we broke fire code. We all found a way to fit in AP Green. I don't know how we did that. Tiny, I mean, we were much smaller. We've grown. But guys, I, it, it, who cares if we grow, if we lose the soul of who God wants us to be? What does it, what does it count if we gain the whole world and, let for, and forfeit our souls? Guys, so guys, how do I close this out from this, guys? I, I, pray and get advice and think through when I, if, I'm, if, if I'm not here physically, if I'm not with the body physically, why? Yeah. Why? Yeah. There's times it's a legitimate need. Yeah. But is this a want? Yeah. And let me get some advice about this after I pray. Let me pray again. Let me fast about this if I need to. Okay? But guys, Zoom and YouTube should not be our easy buttons. Yeah. I'm just going to say that, okay? It, it, discipleship. It's hard. Yeah. Jesus said, if you follow me, you must be willing to lose your very life. Yeah. That's what Jesus said. 
I ain't, I ain't making, I, 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 look, I, I think we all, I, it ain't our standard. It's Jesus' standard. And that's why we're here, amen? amen. So talk, pray about it, get advice about it. You talk to me about it. If you're like, James, what are you talking about? Talk to me. That's fine. It's, it's, we'll work it out, amen? But I, I feel passionate about this because of verse 26. If we deliberately, I don't think it's an accident, guys, that there's this, 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 this thought about being together. And then we go into this. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I'll repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall to the hands of the living God. And we've got to draw near to God's wrath. It's a part of who he is. And I'm, also, I'm like, I, I love you guys. I know you love me, and we got to fight to help each other stay in this. Because whether we go, here's the thing, we can go to everything, but if our heart ain't right, we're going, we're, we're just, and there's times, you, raw obedience is necessary sometimes, okay? Sometimes you got to do the right thing, whether you feel it or not. But that's not sustainable if that's how it is the rest of your Christian life. You will walk away, we will walk away, we've seen dear friends walk away. So I'm emotional because I'm thinking about my friends. And, uh, you know, part of this is, you know, uh, we got to protect each other. we got to have each other's backs. Is that our heart for each other when it comes to this? You know, are we going to call each other to the standard of Jesus? You know, I, I, I'm willing to say what I need to say. But when we studied the Bible, we said, man, we're all in this together. We're all ministers of reconciliation. We call each other to Jesus, not one man, not one sister, to Jesus. And there's a part of this, guys, that is scary to think about because, I mean, you read that, it's just, it's, it's scary. And there's this idea of being deliberate. This, that, that convicts me because that just, that's not just about being with the body physically. That's about a lot of things in our life. I can be deliberate. I could be deliberately unfaithful about many things in my walk with Jesus. A lot of this comes down to, man, I got to think through, okay, I got to think through how am I going to follow Jesus in this area of my life? Am I getting advice about my finances? Am I getting advice about my evangelism? Am I getting advice about just my personal devotionals? My, I don't feel like I'm close to God when I pray. Okay, are you just sitting on that? Are you getting advice and being intentional about that, the fact that it's been that way for a month? It should not be that way for a month. If you're going two weeks, it's like, oh, I, 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 feel, I feel numb. It may be, you may be numb for a while, but don't, don't sit on that by yourself. Now, I appreciate, I was, I was, I was, me and Davion were, were praying on the way to the wedding yesterday. It's, you know, 20, solid 20 minute drive. And, and bro, let's pray. And I was, I was you know, I just feeling all these things in my heart. And I was just so good to pray together. Just to, he didn't say anything that we, we just pray. We didn't have time for him to disciple me. He did, you know, but uh, I want that. But, um, you know, it, it, was, it was after we prayed. So after we prayed, it was just like, that's all I needed was for him to hear me. He discipled me for then we prayed. That's what happened. And it was just like, wow, I feel hurt. I feel like I can, I can carry on. I can keep going. All this, guys, is just to be intentional because I don't think it's an accident that this writer he fleshes it out. Yeah. I mean, he really, I, I read this and I get uncomfortable. Yeah. There is no sacrifice for sins left at this point. If we insult the spirit of God who died for us. And God's kind of like, dude, yeah, what, a, what? if that wasn't enough, if an act of pure love was not enough, I don't know what to tell you, bro. There's nothing, like, I literally died for you on a cross, the most humiliating, painful thing 
someone can undergo. I, I, I already did that. So if that's not enough, I, I don't know what to tell you. And I think maybe that's why he does that. I think we have to be comfortably aware but all of, of the discomfort that this brings. Yeah. And we have to learn to have that tension. I think sometimes, guys, we, and I think that's going to help us minister to each other. It's going to help us minister to the lost. Because we have to have a healthy grasp of God's wrath. Yeah. So that it helps us. You know, guys, it's okay to fear God. Yeah. Sometimes we have an aversion, I think, of this idea of fear. Like, I should never be driven by fear. I don't know. I see fear a lot in the Bible. So we have to reconcile our aversion to fear sometimes. And it's not, it's not shouldn't be all fear. That's not healthy. But it certainly can't be all grace because Jesus was grace and truth. I'll share you guys with this. You know, uh, being a father has helped me a lot. See, see the heart of God. Um, we, I, when it comes to, when my kid disobeys, we have to discipline her, okay? We call them pow-pows in the house. Uh, we call them pow-pows. And, uh, you know, Ruthie, y'all, y'all see my kid. She likes to flex on me in particular, especially in about 20 minutes from now, every Sunday. Uh, she'll fly, you know, she'll, here's the thing. We have, so we got a trainer, right? We got a trainer to have a healthy view of things. So when we have our pow-pows, we never do it in public. We never do it in public. We don't shame this kid. And we, before we ever do it, we train her for weeks on end on this specific character thing we're looking to help her develop. Weeks. We don't hold her accountable to it because we're training her on it. Before we ever to expect her to obey, we are talking about it. And then when it happens, finally, we take her to the bathroom. Okay? So I have to make that walk with her so that I discipline not out of anger, but out of love. Right. Calms me down. And we don't leave that bathroom. After the deed is administered, the three pow pows, here's the thing. When we teach this, Okay? We reenact scenes, and it's me. I'm the, ba- I'm the disobedient one, okay? So she gets to pow-pow me, all right? So we have a paddle ball. We rip off the paddle ball, and I didn't get this idea. I didn't come up with this. The Moldens help us out with our kids, amen? So uh, Haley's awesome. So I look at Haley. I'm like, man, there's hope in Israel, amen? Uh, and that's just, it. That's just Haley, but, you know, you're, her sister's too, right? So I'm like, man, I, 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 I let her pow-pow me. And she thinks, yeah, yeah, dad, you're disobedient, right? So she understands that there's consequences for everybody. Me too. I'm also under authority here, okay? But we don't leave the bathroom after it happens, after we've prayed and hugged it out, okay? We pray, we hug it out. A lot of you guys do it way better than me. You guys are probably like, as I describe my process, you're like, let me give this guy some pointers, right? I'm not saying I do this perfectly, but I do believe that there is an understanding that we're developing of who she is in relationship to authority and of wrath and of consequences. The real heart I'm trying to teach is that when she's all grown up, there will be an authority that she cannot see, that she has to be willing to submit to as I do, and if we do not submit to this authority, that's this invisible authority, there will be consequences. And it's not, I, I don't administer these consequences. That's from God. Part of healthy relationship is a healthy fear. Not an overwhelming fear, not a consistent fear, but as children, my child and we as children of God, we need to understand that there will be far more powerful consequences than anything our earthly dads could administer in one day. Where is our fear of God? We must lean in and draw near. I'm not saying this is the only part, right? I, I, I never preach about wrath, this is, but Hebrews 10 talks about it. So here we are, right? Here it is. We got to draw near to this part of who God is. He is a God we need to fear for our own good. We don't fear him because, oh, God wants us around walking like some, a bunch of scared kids. That's not God's heart. God says, I want you to f- have a healthy fear of me for your own good. Jesus was the Lamb of God, right? Amen for that. He comforts us. But he was the Lion of Judah. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Praise God for that scripture. Amen? 
And I need a gentle Lord. I need a humble Lord, all right? But he also did not hesitate to call Peter, one of his best friends, Satan. Like, dude, in front of all my friends. Why would you say that to me, right? He could have been like, Lord, you disrespect me like this. I'm out of here, right? But he hung in there. Jesus said, love your enemy. Love your enemy. That by itself is like, oh, my goodness. Love someone, anybody. That's hard. Love your enemy. He, but he also said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners. Praise God. But he did not hesitate to divide father from son, mom from daughter, and brother from sister. If it came to f- calling them to follow his lordship, we must love and devote ourselves to Jesus as full of truth. As much as we are loved and are comforted that he is full of grace. Brothers and sisters, let us be deliberate in our Christianity moving forward. You know, it says, do not, if we deliberately keep on sinning, right? Let's be deliberate in the opposite way. Let us be deliberate in getting time with those we are in discipling relationships with this week. And ask each other. You know, for a lot of this is our first full, full, first full week, week, week back from Orlando. Coming down for a landing. Amen? So this is our first week back all together, right? We just had a wedding. It's been crazy. But here we are, back as a family. And let's ask each other in these discipling relationships, brother, sister, where do you see me holding my heart back from God? And where do you see me holding my heart back from God's people? Let's ask you, ask two or three people that here this week. Get, some, get with somebody in person, call someone on the phone when you're driving somewhere. Get, get, a, get a good cross section if you want to be scientific about it, amen? Some of you guys may have this talk, and those closest to you may say, man, I'm trying to be more like you. Which, if that's you, praise God. But I know I got some things I need to change. I know there are areas of my heart where I've forgotten how God has drawn near to me how I take those things for granted. This week, let's draw near to God. Every time you wake up and decide to read your Bible, first thing. You think about that. If you decide to to do that this week, you're literally entering the most holy place. All because of what Jesus did for you. Let's draw near to God's people. Let's make a plan for how we can be present for each other. And how we can be considerate of how we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And let's draw near to God's wrath. Let's love Jesus for all of who he is. If this is something that's challenging for you, pray about this. Study out the scriptures that are like, whoa, whoa, Jesus, that's intense. There's a lot of them. And get re-familiar with that part of who Jesus is. Not just the part we naturally cling to, but also the part of him that challenges our very soul. Amen? Amen. I love you guys. Thank you. Amen. Oh, nice and hot. All right. How are you guys doing? So my name is Naftali, a.k.a. As you guys know me as Tally, representing from St. Louis. We have anyone else from St. Louis here? Thank you, one other person. Amen. I had the pleasure to uh, celebrate Jacob and Sammy Rissman yesterday, and it was an amazing experience. Um, Thank you, Janice, for the lesson. Uh, It was very, very inspiring and very convicting. You know, I go back and think of uh, drawing near to God, drawing near to his wrath. Uh, Sometimes, this is something I struggled with in in, uh, college when I had such a perfectionist mindset growing up as a kingdom kid. It's like I always have to be perfect. I have to do what's right. And it's very, very scary because we're human beings and we're all sinners. So the moment you fall short, Satan uses that as an opportunity to say, hey, you're not, you're not, you're not really God's person, God's people. So might as well just keep doing it, whatever it is that you're doing, right? And you fall into that cycle and, and you start to forget the concept of what God's grace is. You know, so I really, really appreciate that just rem- that remindance, remembrance of God sent his son down so that we can have this relationship with him as a sinner. We're able to draw near to him as we are. I think of drawing near to his people, 
Guys, there's no, despite what people say, you can't have Christianity without community. It, they go hand in hand. There's too many scriptures that say, you know, let us consider how we can spur one in each other on. Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. See to it that each other, we don't have sinful, unbelieving hearts. There's too many examples in the Bible that we, we ought to be with each other. Seeing how God has moved in other people, why would we not want to do that? Why would we not want to be spurred on and help spur other people on? And last, I think about drawing near to God in general. I think every single aspect of things that we draw near to is a part of God. Satan tells us that we don't deserve to be in his presence. But I think of Psalm 139 when David says, where can I run from your presence? Where can I flee from you? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. Guys, there's nowhere we can go on this earth or in our lives where we can escape the presence of God. The presence of his glory is in heaven. The presence of his justice is in hell. The presence of his power is here on earth. And the presence of his grace is with his people. So do not allow anybody to make you think that you are not worthy to be in God's presence because God has already reminded us time and time again that we are with him and he is with us always. So thank you so much for that lesson. It was very inspiring. All right.